Hello. So, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Joe and I'm a tutor with Norton. Uh, I mainly tutor economics um, and I'm a recent graduate from Oxford University with a BA in economics and management. Um, so, today, in this video, I'm going to walk over with you an example of an interview question that you might get asked in an Oxbridge setting, uh, specifically with a focus on the economics portion of the interview. So this might be relevant to you if you're studying or planning to study uh, economics and management or maybe PPE, history and economics, something like that. So the question that I'm going to cover over today is supposing that you are in a room with 99 other people and these are people who have a similar economics background to yourself. Um, so they might be economists, uh, they might be people looking to study economics in some form. We're just assuming that they have some sort of level of economic literacy here. So everybody in the room is asked to guess a number between 0 and 100. So inclusive of both 0 and 100, so those can be responses as well. And before you guess, everybody in the room is told that whoever's guess is equal to two-thirds of the room's average wins a thousand pounds. So if the room's average is, for example, um, 30, then two-thirds of that would be 20, so if you guessed 20, then that would be correct. Obviously that's just a hypothetical example and the average might be something different, um, but knowing that, how much should you guess in this example? So I'm just going to let you kind of have a think about the answer that you'd like to respond with for a second here. and. Um, it's got to be said that in an interview setting, it's not so much just kind of a, a one question, one answer response. Usually your answer will be developed upon or refined or revised because in a question like this, the chances are you've probably got it wrong first time and that's completely fine. But then the interview process is all about how you develop and uh, refine your answer uh, in the face of new information or challenges to the assumptions that you've probably made. Okay, so moving on. In answering this question, it's very important to be careful uh, because the chances are with something like this you've probably arrived at a bit of a gut instinct answer. Uh, so something like 66, 33, 100, um, all of these are really common responses. So just to explain the kind of logic behind those, uh, 66 is two thirds of 100, that's quite a common response. Um, even though it's not necessarily so maybe logical, a really common answer would be to respond something like 33, where you assume that the average in the room is 50, do two thirds of that. And 100, I have a little bit less of an explanation for, but in the data we tend to see that as a pretty common response as well. So, usually gut instinct is wrong when an Oxbridge interview setting. Um, if all of the questions that were asked in an interview were just easily answered within kind of two or three seconds, um, then it wouldn't make for a very good question. So it's really important that when you have this initial kind of response or this initial urge to kind of respond and an answer pops into your head very quickly uh, without too much reasoning or logic behind it, um, then it's very important that you challenge that. And to clarify, it, that doesn't necessarily mean that you should be sitting in silence for you know a minute or two whilst you really ponder this, um, but it's okay to kind of walk through your reasoning with the tutor um, that is interviewing you and they will then help and guide you along to the kind of correct kind of way of thinking about this. So it's completely fine if you answered something like this, you wouldn't be chucked out of an Oxford interview. Um, I think if I was ans uh, answering this in the first time I would have probably gone for something similar to 33 as my response. Um, but then the important thing, as I'll keep saying, is how you end up responding to new information that the tutor in gives you. So. Let's have a look at how the theoretical correct answer to this would look. So, digging into our logic of why we did something like 33. So the logic behind this would be that um, everybody is um, guessing randomly. That, that, that's the assumption that we're kind of making here, is that somebody might guess 5, somebody might guess 92, another 72, something like that. And if we have 100 people in a room, and take the average of all their responses, then that would likely come out to 50. So we're assuming that people just have this kind of like random spurge of answers, and on average this would come out to 50 if we're taking the average of all of those responses. So again, the logic here is, is that we want to take two thirds of that average in order to try and win that thousand pounds, so we'll guess something like 33. And the logic behind this is kind of pretty compelling, it kind of makes sense on an intuitive first look basis, 
Um, however, it is wrong for a reason. Because, as we sort of said before, everybody else is playing this game as well. So everybody else is also looking to guess two-thirds of the room's average. And when that's taken into account, um, they're going through exactly the same reasoning that you are. So people aren't necessarily guessing randomly, as we might have guessed, um, but instead they're looking to get at a number that is two-thirds of the room's average, um, which is by necessar like which is necessarily um, below something like 50, and maybe even below something like 30. So let's say that another person in the room thinks that the average is going to be 50. They will also then guess 33. Um, and then if everybody is thinking like that, then the room's average will actually end up being 33, as everybody guesses 33. So you might be kind of then wondering, well, why don't we take it another step? So if everybody in the room is kind of thinking 33, then we could undercut that and go to something like 22. So I've written that a bit uh, rubbishly there. There we go, 22. And that would be a perfectly kind of correct response. So if everybody's guessing 33, the average is 33, you guess 22, then that would undercut um, the 33, it'd be two thirds of that, and you'd win the money. However, the next kind of logical increment to this is that everybody else is also going through that process as well. So then everybody might guess 22 the same as you. So you might follow it down another step, do two thirds of 22, which becomes uh, 14 and a little bit, but let's just say 14 for kind of good measure. And you might have noticed a pattern here, in that we're starting to kind of chase each other down. So we're going through this process of you undercutting two-thirds uh, of, of the average, or what you expect to be the average in the room, and everybody else going through exactly the same process as you are. Um, so what we end up seeing is this kind of race down. And as we kind of like kind of think about where this kind of process is going, um, because we could kind of keep up this iteration um, permanently, and eventually we'll chase each other down to zero. So just to clarify, we're not saying that everybody did actually guess 50, and then you guess 30 uh, on top of that, um, and this is like over several rounds. What we're assuming is that people are kind of taking the foresight to have a really good think about what everybody else is guessing, and is basing their own answer on their predictions. So, and then when we're kind of chasing each other down this kind of like iteration or like um, sort of rabbit hole approach of kind of continually revising down, okay, so what is two thirds of the average? Okay, and then that becomes the sort of new average as everybody else is guessing that. So we need to do two thirds of that. Um, and then that process is kind of converging all the way down to this zero point. So um, if you haven't figured it out by now, then the actual answer that we'd be looking for is actually zero itself because what we've realized is that in the room everybody else is continuing to revise their answer downwards as they are each wanting to get two-thirds of the room's average which um, by sort of necessarily reduces the amount of um, the room's average itself so it, everybody else's guesses is lowering the average of the rooms itself and then that process is kind of iterating um, and that process kind of continues until we get that answer of zero, um, past which we can't really, well, two-thirds of zero is zero, so that would be a sort of answer in this case. Okay, so you might be wondering at this point, what does this really have to do with economics? So it's quite a, a curious question, it's quite a, um, it's quite an interesting answer that we've just arrived at, because it's quite counterintuitive, um, and what we'll see is, is that this is really a great example of a game theory style environment. Um, so in something like game theory, we have a, a what we call a game or like a situation such as the one that we've just covered where we have 100 people in a room, they're each guessing. And there's a few examples uh, or a few assumptions that we make in these economic games, um, such as that everybody has common understanding of the rules of the game, um, which we have here and that everybody is basically playing to maximize their own rewards. So we're assuming that everybody wants to win that £1,000 that we were just talking about. So, in a game theory approach, we also assume that everybody is basically having that ability to have foresight and really think about what other people are doing in the same situation. Not just kind of focusing on yourself, but thinking about what incentives other people face and then acting on those. 
So when we take those approaches into account, that's when we get that kind of iteration down to zero, uh, where people are continually doing two thirds of the average. Um, so you may have covered some game theory before, and hopefully you have. Um, but uh, yeah, if, if you haven't, then it'd be a really good time to kind of start thinking about brushing up on it, because it's very common. Um, it's a very common topic in Oxford interviews because it doesn't require too much specialist knowledge to kind of get involved with. And like I say, it can kind of be really good for these um, styles of questions where you may have an initial response to them, but actually when you think about it a lot more, um, then you realize that your original response would be wrong and that the answer is maybe a little bit counterintuitive, it's quite clever maybe, um, and that you should kind of like keep pursuing it like that. So, um, it's a good idea to be clued up on the basic games and principles. So a basic game is something like The Prisoner's Dilemma, which I think a lot of people have probably heard of by now. If you haven't, I'd recommend you research online about it. It's quite a quick topic. Um, and then also something like the Nash Equilibrium, or Equilibria, if there's more than one. Um, so something like the Nash Equilibrium is actually what we found in this kind of situation. It's, it's, it's that kind of the end result of this kind of game where everybody um, doesn't have this kind of what we'd call like a profitable deviation. So everybody, when they're playing this game, um, it makes sense to go down to zero. It doesn't make sense to guess 100 at this point or even 50, um, provided that everybody else is kind of playing by those same rules and that they're thinking about it similarly to you. Um, so zero is actually Nash equilibrium in this kind of game that we've just been outlining. Okay, so is your answer realistic? Um, and that would be a kind of a typical example of like a, a follow-up question in in economics um, or in this interview kind of style question. Um, so it's a really good question because, frankly, if you probably asked a room of a hundred people who are actually economists, as uh, this data has actually done, this they somebody ran an experiment, um, asked a load of people who had uh, knowledge in economics and a load of people who didn't have knowledge in economics, the same kind of question, and they tallied up all the same responses. So um, on the right here, on this kind of right hand side diagram, um, this one, um, these are the kind of the, the people who were just polled in a random newspaper, and we can see the distribution of their guesses. So some people actually did arrive at that kind of ideal solution of zero. But as we said, 33 was a really common example, 22 was a common uh, answer, um, and 22 was that kind of first iteration of where we say, well, it's not 33, so if everybody guesses 33, I'll guess that 22. Um, and so that's quite interesting that people chased it down to maybe that first iteration of doing that approach, but then didn't think to kind of chase it all the way down to zero. Um, and again, 66 is a pretty common answer, 100 is a pretty common answer. Um, and yeah, so, but what we note here is, is that what actually happens is that not everybody chose zero. So actually your ideal answer would probably be, uh, I mean, where's the mean in something like this? I mean, you'd probably assume it's somewhere around here. So choosing an answer that is actually at around 10 would probably be the one that actually gave you the, uh, the payout in this kind of case, because the average in this kind of distribution is probably, like I say, around sort of 15 or so. So two thirds of that would be 10. If you chose that in the newspaper, you'd probably actually have your best an uh, chance of winning that thousand pounds. So the answer is a lot less um, than what people might have kind of initially assumed, or what you might have initially assumed, guessing sort of 33 or 66 or something like that. Um, but actually, that kind of Nash equilibrium of zero might not actually be the best answer when applied in real life. Um, and if you kind of think about why that might be, this is basically because in game theory we have quite a few, um, we, we make quite a few large assumptions. We're assuming that people are thinking perfectly rationally about all of these things. We're thinking that people are really thinking about what other people are doing. And in just the same way that you may have kind of leapt to a first conclusion and uh, an answer like that, um, so might other people do um, the same thing. So it's it's important in real life that kind of game theory doesn't necessarily apply so strongly. And we also see that in our economists kind of section. So all of these people are people who are really good at economics. They're already students or they're professors and um, they're all at quite an advanced level. So the interesting thing here is, is that we see a lot more people arrived at zero as an answer. Interestingly, a relatively larger amount of people arrived at 100, which is a very sort of incorrect answer. Um, 
and very few people write this kind of 67, 33 is still pretty common, 22 is still pretty common, but the main answer is zero. Um, even then, the, the kind of the winning answer in this kind of situation, even with people who probably have a good understanding of game theory and economics, the winning answer would probably still wouldn't be zero. It'd just be kind of somewhere around this kind of level, probably a bit under 10, it might be kind of sort of seven or so. Um, so it's interesting that in real life, if you're actually playing this game, um, it's important to kind of take into account the game theory response, but then you also would want to kind of include these kind of behavioral responses of other people and include that irrationality into your answer if you really wanted to win that money. Okay, so that would be a typical extension to this kind of interview style question. Um, and just a few kind of final closing thoughts um, is that A, it's okay to be wrong, especially at the start. Um, It'll often these kind of questions, especially with game theory questions, which are quite common in Oxford uh, economics interviews, um, you'll usually arrive at an answer that is incorrect at the start, and it is the tutor's job to kind of point that out to you, and it is then your job to correct your answers over time, or instead kind of justify your opinion, then you'll have this kind of back and forth dialogue with the tutor where you gradually kind of refine your opinion over to what might be a kind of a correct answer. Um, it's all about how you kind of go through that process. So interviews are looking for somebody who's open to new ideas, but also capable of criticizing and questioning the, the kind of typical answers or the status quo. Um, so in this kind of situation, you may like I think ideally almost you would probably be challenging that answer the ideal game theory answer of zero saying well does this actually happen in real life um, and something like that an approach like that would stand you very well in an interview setting because it shows that you are understanding of what the kind of game theory approach might tell us um, but that you're also kind of not taking things just on face value um, not just kind of sort of sitting and nodding um, but that you're actually actively thinking about it and challenging these thoughts in your head. Um, equally it's quite easy to go too far and be very insistent on your own opinion um, so it's very important to remember that the the, the interviewers sitting across from you are very also very good at their field. Um, they're, they're not necessarily perfect um, but the chances are that they've done these interviews quite a lot before um, in that they know the questions, extensions to the questions um, and they probably have the right answer. So if they're kind of looking to guide you onto a new approach you'd probably be very wise to take that into account um, as opposed to kind of just pushing it back against them too hard. Um, so yeah, none of these things will ruin your interview if you kind of fall prey to it. So if you get the initial answer wrong, that's completely fine. It's almost maybe ideal because then you get to show how you kind of revise and adapt your answers in, in the face of new um, data or interpretation. Um, but try and obviously strike the balance. So it's important to let the tutor be able to kind of speak to you. Um, it's important to kind of take things on board. Um, but then if you feel strongly about an opinion or a subject, then perhaps it's worth arguing it a little bit more, but not to the kind of extremes. Um, okay, so that kind of concludes all that I've wanted to say. Um, I hope that this uh, video has been helpful for you um, and that it's provided a little bit of insight into what an interview in Oxford environments would be like, or Cambridge for that matter. Um, so thank you very much for listening and watching, and I might see you again soon.